All righty. We're here with uh, Mr. Tommy Davey. <coughs> Howdy. <laughs> Dude, you're standing behind you is like gypsy jazz guitar porn. It's like, <laughs> this is pretty incredible stuff you got going. Uh, yes, I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm in Chicago and we had like caravan guitars here for years. It just yep. shut down. And mm -hmm. you, but you guys like you're, you're keeping it strong and steady. So you're, you're basically, how did this passion for have, I'm, I'm just <clears throat> trying to look behind you. <laughs> oh, sure. Like, like, oh my God, man. So you just love this shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've always loved it from the time that I, um, <laughs> first got introduced to um you know this this kind of music but it, it you know it started which, which off, was when uh i think it was uh nam show 2002 that i okay. really discovered it or rediscovered it um my father was a longtime jazz guitar player uh from the uh dc area mm -hmm. and was a fan of uh danny gatton herb ellis um you know, all the great guitar players from that area, from New York. Um, and everybody always talked about Django to him when he was growing up. But the problem was no one really knew anything concrete about him. It was always this kind of, um, yeah, he was a gypsy and he played these weird guitars that him and his brother made or something, you know, some weird story about it. And um, I grew up occasionally hearing it in repeat on the, on the system, you know, in the car. Mm -hmm. on a tape you know and um it was always in the back of my mind it was always familiar and i enjoyed rock music um jazz fusion all all different kinds of stuff no nothing particular i was kind of a dabbler mm -hmm. uh but i decided i was like okay we're gonna go to the nam show how old are and you at this point i think i was about 14 14 uh -huh. 15 years old nice. and i'm walking down the aisle and to my left all of a sudden i hear like two guys playing Rose Room, and it was a friend of mine uh, named Jeff Ross, um, mm -hmm. and they were playing Del Arte guitars. And within about 15 minutes, I bought the, the least expensive guitar they had there, and I just said, this is what I want to do. And it was like, even, like a D-hole or an overhole? It was a uh, 14 fret overhole, like, uh -huh. like similar to your guitar. Uh -huh. And um, I started learning, and it was just an obsession. It became this very strange shift, if you will. Yeah, uh, the style of music just grabs people in a way that you can't really convey. Mm -hmm. I think it's it just becomes I don't know what it is about it, but there's there's definitely something that just grabs you in a place where it doesn't it's relentless. I, I would I would agree. I think it's it's a kind of sincere music that um, it has it has so much meaning behind it and so much feeling because i think the people who were the um, originators the the sort of uh genesis of it was was made by people who uh expressed themselves for generations through music mm -hmm. you know and it was the guitar is small and portable and it travels well and yeah the music you know accumulated through these travels you know and i think that's what that's what we hear i think that's the thing that nobody really puts their can really it put their finger it, on it's compact so much history right yes and, and the playing it's like sums up culture traveling people for hundreds yes. of years and it's just channeling this like the depth of it is not like a, a rihanna record <laughs> yeah that, yeah <laughs> <laughs> put it mildly um so you're 14, you're discovering this thing. What, 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 what's the next move? How do you learn? So I, I was lucky that I had um, a series of teachers in, in my area. This, uh, this fellow, uh, Don King, who's a, a, still a great friend to this day and um, an amazing. We love, we love what he did for Tyson, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> His hair is amazing. Um, but he, he was sort of a collector of transcriptions. He would hmm. do these he was obsessed with transcriptions, whether it was, um, I, I think he was, he showed me some Steve Vai transcriptions that he got, you know, directly from Steve or whether it was, uh, Holsworth 
like knocking at his door and and trying to get Alan to make corrections to his, you know, <laughs> it's this kind of obsession. But he uh, did, you know, like Rosenberg Trio and all these classic records in the early 90s, mm. just in completion. So I had access to these volumes and I still have them of just this raw, you know, just it's all written out in treble clef, which I can't really read. I can I can peck it out, but enough to get the the. The, the material and the concept at that at that time, I was mm. able to sort of figure out that. But the, the, the really challenging thing that I was kind of forced to do on my own um, was really the tech, technical aspect of the right hand technique and the, the nuances of touch to get the sound to be correct. Sure. So it was correct point as your, possible. At what point in your development did you start realizing about, let's say, the rest joke thing? Because I, I saw you playing. You definitely, you're a great player, and you definitely have it down. So, what? At what mm-hmm. point did you start, like, really using that mechanical, mechanical approach? I guess. So, um, it, you know, I think it, it became really. Uh, I, I started understanding it as soon as my teacher at the time gave me exercises specifically with like diminished repeating patterns that mm-hmm. would would go up or descending or ascending just as like you know an etude sort of thing mm-hmm. and just looking at it and going oh okay well this is the this is the picking pattern you do it enough and then you start to understand that it's easier to do it this way mm-hmm. that you're not bound it's not like you have to try to do it it becomes a, then a vehicle to do it even faster and sure. if you just repeat it enough, it then will become like um, second nature. Of course. And I think I think the thing that people do really don't understand, I think, about this kind of music and this technical approach is that it it makes you map out the lines a certain way on the fretboard that, you know, is natural to that picking. It's, it's like, you know, th- that technique shapes the kind of traveling you would do through, you know, through a piece of music rather than, you know, let's say a bluegrass <clears throat> player or an Ingve Malmsteen. They just arrange the notes a little bit differently mm-hmm. to, to compensate for that thing. So would you show us like maybe like th- those kind of things that you would practice in <laughs> loops? Like yeah. Those... Um, let me uh, let me get a, a guitar. Sure. Hold on, I have to unplug this. I think you'll find one. <coughs> How does he choose? Oh my god. I I'd throw a fit being in there. Look at that. It's like is that my, what Charlie felt like in the factory. Oh. Okay, we're back. Yeah. Seems a little short. I was just telling everybody that I'd, I'd throw a fit if I was like just turning around, being like, "How do you pick one?" <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible. Uh, oh. But can you bend? Can you bend our screen a little bit so we can see oh, yeah, yeah. your your hand? There we go. Yeah, okay. yeah, perfect. So, have the short, the world's shortest headphone cable. <laughs> This yeah, kind so of sweeping things. kind of things. That, the, that those kind of licks, yeah. Yeah, and uh, this kind right. of thing. So the so the sweep it started with like those three string sweeping kind of deals. Yeah, but and, later, you know, once you have this kind of thing, I think the thing, and I'm sort of remembering this now, the 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 really important thing was learning the waltzes. Mm. And later I had many conversations with players and they always told me, if you really want to know how to mechanically work the guitar to a, like a master level, the waltzes have everything, all the technical aspects, all the string changes, all the open strings. And that's something that the, the real, the serious players that, that I am totally enthralled with they all have that in common that they spend this part of their time or or in at least in their development they know these waltzes like a library you know it's mm. like they really know these yeah because um, those are really a, they're unlike the the rest of the tunes in the sense that they're really compositions 
that, yes. that people play and the, the slots for freedom are much more like decorating these melodies rather than improvising them. Yes. And you yeah. really understand how to interpret what what mm -hmm. is given and make your own personal version. Touches. Right. Exactly. Right, right. So if you were to say what are the quintessential waltzes to learn, what, what would they be in your mind? So I, I would definitely suggest um, uh, the Montan Saint Genevieve, which is, you know, Django's waltz, mm -hmm. that one, um, maybe um, Che Jacquet, which is like... Uh, <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. thing but in, in addition to that not just the solo part is the important part but to me the one of the most important things to really understand the mindset of these players back in the 30s was the accompaniment because mm. the accompaniment when you really listen to it it's so different than what's going on now because the whole band is working in conjunction with the soloist as one one voice and there's interplay like classical mm -hmm. musicians in chambers mm -hmm. Um, and now what, what you hear when people play waltzes, like if you were to play the same thing, it's like they're hacking it to death. With the check, right check, end. check, check, it, check, check. They're like taking yes. the over. There's zero interaction and not, exactly. not a whole lot of like counterpoint in the rhythm part. To, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, is, that, that is the bizarre a, thing. This is a, this is a debate that people will, how do you play a waltz or how should the band play the rhythm? This is like a huge thing. Well, Tommy, if you were taking the role of a producer uh, mm -hmm. or like just a band director and you had like, you know, a rhythm guitarist and a bassist and somebody wasn't doing it, uh, somebody was hacking through it, what would you, how would you coach them into doing it the, in a way that you find oh. pleasing? Like what's the kind of interaction really, you're after? That's a really hard, hard thing to go, to go, the direction to go because you, you almost have to have a musician that already knows. Right. You can't, you can't un, un, undo it to them. You know, once they have, once they, the, if they're not hearing it when they listen to the original recording or look at the music, it's just, it's, what could you do, you know? Yeah, well, that's, that's always, I, I think the, the frustration most people have in any style of music with bandmates is like when, when somebody does not understand a certain aesthetic, you try to like mold the person to become a diff, like a, an improved version of themselves. But it's a lot of times you, you said you hit the nail on the head. It seems that if you're looking at the big picture and you can't recognize the details that make it tick, nobody can point it to you, right? It's like pointing at a color and being like, that's blue. And the person's like, no, that looks orange. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> but, and, and it, do, it doesn't help that in nowadays, with with so much of the way that this music is being played that those kind of old traditions or that school there's not very many musicians who are really choosing to go there mm -hmm. and no one really wants to acknowledge it in in most circles i mean this is this is a, a whole other whole other thing that well you know, so you're controversial you're, but it yeah, is well it's good you're, you're presenting a, a, a viable perspective which is you are somewhat of a purist right you want to maintain something from something deep that you recognize in, in some sort yeah. of tradition that's being interpreted in a very basic way nowadays. Yeah, but that's it, not to say that it, the new style doesn't have a place and it's, it's amazing and vibrant and full of amazing um, um, substance, you know. Right. It's, it's, a different, it's just different, but, um, you know, there are, of course, like with violin, there's always schools of players you know that are going to disagree of how something should be interpreted so sure. it's not it's not a new thing you know yeah the way i see it i think the danger of especially platforms like instagram that like allow for like maybe one minute videos is that you lose a little bit of nuance in music and the kind of content that people are after is very you know one dimensional and mm -hmm. I, I mean i don't want to name players but it's uh but they, you guys know who you are. Uh, <laughs> but but it's uh, pajamming. I mean, that's what we call it. Like playing alone at home leads to a very certain kind of playing, which is you have your shit together, and then yeah. 
getting together with people is just people emulating a backing track or a click track or some sort of yeah. artificial situation to where you can just execute your stuff and go home. And mm -hmm. these people, don't, like Django himself and those people, they, they were just guys hanging out, creating a sound. So everybody did whatever they could to just yeah. work into this really intricate, fix, weave this intricate picture together. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And That's, yeah. You're you're definitely definitely right about that. I mean, that's the th the the big the big difference that that when I when I first really experienced you know sitting two feet from a guy, just completely playing playing the living shit out of the guitar. For me, it was just eye opening because I saw I was like, wow, what what I'm being told is not the way that you get here. Oh yeah. And that's a whole, that's a whole other, there's that osmosis aspect to this music that is so important mm -hmm. um, that I feel that's like just sitting and watching it, not even in the beginning, I, I was lucky that a lot of the way that the, the workshops that were, that were set up in the United States, at least at festivals, it wasn't really a, a holding a guitar in your hand type of exchange with with the pre, the presenter of the workshop it was very much like you're lucky enough to sit in the room with the guy and hear him play for 35 minutes mm -hmm. and at the end of recording that and really seeing it you have the opportunity to observe it naked with no with no rhythm behind it or anything and you start seeing oh that's how it's done mm -hmm. but i find what's happening is that there's this um rush to play with these people and to just I, be, yeah. before you're prepared just be one of the guys exactly <laughs> yeah 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 that i think that's the that's the impatience that yeah. that prevents people from i mean the the and also i'm sure these people are nice guys so they'll play with whoever wants to play with them most of the time but it's it's kind of a hindrance yeah. Right. Cause for, to the players, because it's uh, you know, once you wear that badge, it's like oh, I played with Borelli. It's like just walk around, like <laughs> it's like yeah, but like you know, <clears throat> you know, shooting Jesse James on making Jesse James. Yes. You know, you gotta you, every yeah. That's the thing. You sound the way you sound. So okay, you you're at this point we're we're probably covered like 14 to what 18. You're studying. You're in high school and you're figuring yeah. out some technique stuff. What's the next? Yeah. So at a, at about seven, 17 years old, um, was it 17? Yeah, I was 17. Um, I had already gotten a chance to play with some, some really amazing guys just in like, just being invited, invited up. Um, uh, Stefan Remble, I got mm -hmm. to play with him when I was 16. Uh, also like, the, that was a time for me that was really cool because I, I had a, a relationship with him. I already knew Robin Nolan and mm -hmm. I played with him a little bit um, as a guest and just sat in with his band. And then there was a tour that was going on um, with David Grisman. And so I got invited to to go tour with uh, Stefan Rumble, Robin Nolan and, and David Grisman in like a band of 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 uh, talented children, you know? Nice. And um, so that was like my first real professional experience. Of, Where was the tour? Europe or so here? It was, it was in like Los Angeles and, and up going up the coast of California. We gotcha. played like Santa Cruz and whatnot. And it was really cool. Um, and, and that was kind of a, a unique experience, you know? Um, and, and really eye opening to, you know, like, oh, this is what playing music you know, in front of people feels like. Mm. So, uh, we, at another point in time, like around the same time, um, I, I helped to make a festival in, in uh, my hometown where we had like a lot of gypsies come. So I got a chance to sit with some guys like Angelo DeBar and Bula Ferre and like all these guys and see what they, what, what they're really like. And that what, just, what I, was the, what was the impression? <clears throat> what are they really like? Yeah. They're just, they live in and eat and breathe music and they're just, they're full, full of information and, um, and just amazing music far mm. more than, than, than I could get from YouTube or, or any of their CDs or recordings. It was, uh, you know, it's, it was really special. Were the, what were like pivotal moments that like you really, I guess, got a piece of knowledge in the right time 
Like, could you remember any times like that that like you somebody gave you something like, oh, like that's that's different and like elicited some sort of change? Yeah, well, I'm trying to think. I had one workshop with a with a fellow named John Fredericks, who's a Dutchman who played with Robin Nolan for many years. Mm -hmm. And he really well, first he said, you know, you play rhythm terribly. That was the first thing he said to me. <laughs> and uh, at, at that you? point, oh, I'm sure I did, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and it was like my first real rhythm guitar lesson ever. And at that point in time, I was like, okay, I'm going to really take this to heart. But what I, did, what I did get is just seeing the way the guy moved and he felt the sound. And that to me was the most important thing. And the groove. Mm, he was he was, rea he was reacting to your playing. Not or, so much. Own, not so own. much. More just like watching him in a room by himself play, and just watch other people, you know, be totally rejected by him. And then I was then in turn rejected. But seeing that and being told, no, you're doing it completely wrong, was so important. Mm. Because otherwise, if no one ever says that to you. You're just going to keep doing the same thing. And I, I appreciated the brutal honesty that, that he had in that moment. Uh, um, there's a few other moments that I've had where people just said, oh, that just sounds so screwed up, you know? Yeah. And it was, it was at a time where you could reform and, and correct it. And it motivated you to want to come back to the guy a year later and say, well, what do you think? Is it better? That's that's such a tricky like there's such a tricky like dichotomy in in this thing about music because in one on one hand when you're passing something in an aesthetic field it takes people that know what it's supposed to feel like somebody who heard Django had a feeling heard Stokler Rosenberg had a different kind of feeling heard you is like that's not that feeling that those guys do at all and that comes from an honest helpful place it's like you're doing this procedure wrong because it's supposed you're tr I see what you're trying to do and it's, it doesn't feel right. And then there's a lot of people who just like have strange tastes and are like, it's like, why, why are you playing that way? You know, so you yeah. gotta, you gotta, you gotta trust the right people. But it's a, but it, yeah. I, I think you should be, it's absolutely crucial to be open to devastating criticism, but coming from a person that you know at the end of the day is trying to help you. And so that's, yeah. But at the same time, I've seen a trend going with with teaching and with teaching methods and, you know, events and whatnot that people put on. It's that it's become somewhat of a democracy to the point where the level is being driven so far down because mm -hmm. people are choosing these sort of intermediary arbiters. They don't really know how to do it or mm -hmm. never really learn from from the guys that learn from guys who are now dead, who right. maybe knew somebody who really played with Django. Yeah. There's this kind of like, um, I mean, there's some amazing guys that are, I wouldn't say they're unknown, but there are um, really incredible players that, that really know, but are just not being utilized. And to me, that's, I, I mean, it's to be expected with the times, of course, but, you know, well, that's it's a big issue. It's the, it's the issue you're bringing up is the issue of lineage, and yes. like how 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 do you keep something going that people are just now picking up from YouTube and yes. you know, don't have some sort of direct relationship with? I was I was just yeah. talking to some somebody else on this thing. I don't remember who, but we were talking about uh, T. S. Eliot in, in poetry. He has a book mm -hmm. called On Poetry and of Poets, and he brings up the point that the role of the poet isn't exclusively to write things that people have an emotional connection with. That's one of the roles, but it's also to preserve the historic feelings of all of poetry, meaning like going back to Shakespeare, if it's all of the feelings are riding this wave of words and the language keeps changing. So mm -hmm. one poet just basically keeps the lineage going from poet to poet to where there's some sort of backwards connection into the authentic original feelings that mm -hmm. kind of like serve us all as humanity. And that's true with, with this gypsy playing too. It's like the, or, and the stuff before gypsy jazz, like just the gypsy tradition and, you know, all the synthy music and all the music in general, it all mm -hmm. kind of connects backwards. And I think that your, the frustration you're feeling is very justified because you can definitely buy a ticket to a lot of shows right now where you end up, leaving feeling absolutely nothing and that's a that's a broken machine because you should feel something 
Yeah, you know, and the the interesting thing is that a lot of these people who in when I started in really getting into this and I would go to a festival, it was like the who's who of everybody. But mm. now these people are becoming harder and harder to market. Yeah. For a lot of the festivals. So it's kind of this this is kind of determining the way that things are going. But um I think at least myself and a, f a few other people that are like really diehards that have one foot in the past, you know, with looking at history and the books and the literature, um, there's this bigger side to Django that mm. existed that, that a lot of us recognize, but there's a lot of the newer generation or people who are just getting into it aren't really keyed in on that. But I think also part of the problem is that a lot of collectors are very, very closed and protective and almost shielding a lot of this kind of um, magazine clippings or stories or recordings. I mean, there's a lot of secret recordings out there of guys that are incredible that are never released that, you know, like someone gives me something and I'm not allowed to talk about it or share it with other people. You know, it's this really? kind of, it's very, it's very uh, almost cult like a little bit. Huh. Well, it's like a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine that. It's like a Yeah. There'll be like the weirdest like eyes wide shut party. Everybody's mm. like instead Not of like yak suits, they all have like little mustaches and they're dressed all steampunk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you could you could describe it that way, but it's in some ways it's justified because it at least it leaves things in a in a pure place where the people who are enjoying this and our purveyors of that can protect it in a way yeah, but it's I, keeping I, something sacred in in a very yes. digital environment yes yeah and and it's uh it's just it's funny i mean it is a little bit of a you know we all wear funny hats who play you know gypsy jazz to an extent right but. right well some people go you know go all it's very to me it's strange to see you know but some people really take it to this place of like steampunk almost to where it's like really i'd say infused with their personal life in a in a complete way right mm. like some sort of 30s revival movement almost you know? yeah there's there's this kind of uh wear wingtip shoes and a edwardian collar and the whole bit which I can I could appreciate that. It's cool, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I I find that this stuff is it's it's almost timeless that you don't even need to do that in a lot right. of ways to make it. The music already is doing it for you. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. So, okay, now you're 17, you had a big tour. Uh you met a bunch of famous people getting tips. What what's the next stage? Uh so the next stage was just making a lot of trips to to Europe and really seeing um a lot of the various guitar players in Paris that were like mid 2000s that were mm. playing in Paris, like Moreno, is... like Moreno, Angelo Debar, um, uh, TT Demeter. Um, gosh, I mean, I'm and blanking. are you just going to shows? Are you studying with these people? What <clears throat> what are your what are your trips like? Little vacations? So, are you living there? So I got I I went with my dad. And we just sort of went, you know, to meet up with with Angelo because we knew him from the United States when he was there. So he invited us to a couple concerts and we went around and saw that. We went to the Shop de Pousse, um, the flea market area. Um, I started visiting guitar shops and and that was really, Im really important for me, kind of a catalyst, because that's what sort of got me really interested as soon as I saw the shops and how amazing they were that sold these kind of guitars uh, over in Europe, I was kind of inspired and always had it in the back of my mind. But I didn't really do anything about it uh, for a long time because mm. it just, you know, there's other things. And I was more focused on the actual playing of music uh, and study. Um, how amazing are they? Oh, they're, in they're incredible. It's like it it's um, this kind of romanticism around the lore of these guitars, around the, the, mm. the story of these makers who have almost, uh, I, I would say, an equal uh, as important um, importance in the, the evolution of what we call gypsy jazz as the players themselves. 
because yeah. with the players, the players suggested to the makers and the makers made instruments, you know, and it's this the kind of shaping of the sound and the kind of accidental discoveries that were made. It, it, it's very much intertwined because there's no other kind of guitar that really no. has this this really deep connection. Because when, it, when the guitars were originally developed, they, they were almost classical guitars, mm -hmm. concert instruments. But the inventor of, the, of these guitars, Mario McAfee, never really anticipated that they would be so strongly adopted and embraced by this group of jazz yeah. musicians. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and so that, that basically sparked my interest. I went to a... Um, now a, a friend of mine's shop, uh, Francois Charles, who has the most incredible guitar shop in this old gallery. Mm. And it was just, you know, he's the author of the history of Selmer guitars. Um, he has, you know, original Selmers in the shop, Vinos, Posados, you know, everything, all the accessories and all of the stuff that's not for sale, all the really amazing parts and curio items that he picks up. And he's just really a wealth of knowledge. So when I saw that and I just saw how not only artistic the guitars were, but this, it was, it, it changed me as far as, you know, the direction of my life, seeing this kind of thing. So this is what, 2005? This four? is, 2000, I think the first time 2005, between 2005 and 2008. Okay. And so, after that, how, how does this, how does one get into what you have behind you? Well, this so. The next decade? Yeah, so for, for me, um, I started uh, getting involved in musical instruments because my father is a violin maker, mm -hmm. and I would have you know, many guitars that I didn't really like how they played or there was problems, or I would buy old broken guitars at a discount, and my dad would help me fix them up. So mm. that kind of started this the setup side of me being a setup technician. And I was doing this all throughout high school and through college and whatnot. And I just started getting obsessed with, you know, working on guitars. In college, I had a, a guitar teacher named uh, Miroslav Tadic, who is a mm -hmm. um, great Macedonian uh, guitar player, plays a lot of folk music. But one thing that he, he did do, he was a guitar maker himself. And he was never really satisfied with guitars that were available. So he would make his own electric guitars with, uh, nut spacing of classical guitars and they were just these radical guitars that fit his needs so i was a little bit I, I think a lot inspired by this this idea that nothing off the shelf is good enough hmm. and that really propelled me to want to modify make my own pickups and do things and get my hands dirty and really figure out how to achieve something more than what's just given to you or handed to you um, you know, I, I didn't really like anything that was easy, you know? Mm. Um, so that, that really got me interested in the guitar business. Uh, and then some, some changes, uh, you know, I was going to Europe a lot more because my, my now wife was living in Germany. Mm -hmm. So I was finding myself there and I could make these trips and I could go and, and pick up guitars and talk to people and, um, meet with various people in Germany. So it just kind of snowballed into this, mm. into a, into a business that is sustaining at, at this point. So that's great. And where is the shop located? This is in Los Angeles or in Los Angeles. So I have, uh, I have one satellite location, which is like where the, the main stuff goes on. And then we also have one down in Laguna beach, which is about 60 miles South of here. Mm. So I do do a lot of work on guitars, restore um, old guitars. Um, I work with a lot of clients um, to, you know, find guitars or make them, you know, what they get, what they want out of them. It's, it's yeah, very so, hands-on, particular. So, who are some of your favorite builders right now? Uh, you know, that's that's a really that's a really difficult question to ask because there are so many good ones. Mm -hmm. And there are so many bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how about how about like three standouts that that just you have like a fondness for the? Uh, well, three standouts. I mean, there's some incredible ones. I mean, I love old guitars. I love Favino guitars. I'm pretty obsessed with them. I love Selmer guitars. 
Um, I love Bizzotto Demaro guitars. I kind of have one of everything. Um, uh-huh. Those are those are my real favorites, the ones that have lasted sort of the test of time. Mm. Um, or guitars that were owned by famous musicians, like, um, you know, in Paris or whatnot that are handed down. And then, you know, I in turn then own. But as far as like modern builders, um, I just got a guitar by a maker named Tice Vanderharst from the Netherlands. Mm. And um, it's unfortunate. It lasted like less than 24 hours here as as I got back. (laughs) Somebody got it. Somebody got it. But those guitars are just like crazy consistent. And I really like what he's doing. Um, What else? What else? What else? There's a great Stefan Hall guitar that I have. Mm It, I mean, they're they're amazing, um, but they're more of a hybrid. They're kind of like halfway between an archtop kind of sound, halfway between a gypsy guitar. Not traditional mm. in any sense. Those are the ones with the F hole. The- uh, no, this is a. It's the one like like if you're familiar with Borelli, he played this yeah. red guitar. It's yeah. That guitar. Okay. Um, and let me see. I've got some old ones that I just brought back. I'm restoring. I mean, so that would be like my top, like that's what's going on right now. So it's, um, is it like painful for you to like sell a guitar you really love? Um, <laughs> does it does have, ever hit you hard? There's a whole rack upstairs that I have of about 15 guitars that I would never sell if, if anyone asked me any amount of money. Like, <laughs> and then maybe what I, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it an emotional connection, a history thing or a play, a playing thing? They're usually guitars that have um, a kind of historical connection with them that are mm. that are really special. So you player know, owned, player or? owned, and taken care of, and like usually a lot of really good repairs. You know, like really nice pick guard on it, or you know, it's been French varnished many times, or it's just it's when it's a good one, people take care of it. You know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I yeah, really yeah, like that, or anything nope. that's got the old guy playing it, or you know this kind of real history and it's so which which player or which players have owned the, some of the guitars you have i have one favino that was owned by the foray family mm. and it played on some recordings in the um, late 70s 80s that's like one of my favorite guitars um i have another guitar that's like the, the weirdest and most special it's a guitar it was owned by a russian guy named victor novsky who mm. um played a lot of cabaret stuff and played with a lot of gypsies in, in Paris, not, not gypsy jazz style, but it's, yeah, traditional. it's a jazz guitar, but they often play these as that kind of thing. Mm. Very cool, man. Very cool. So when did you open the shop? Like when did that, when did that thing start? Uh, I believe it was uh, 2012, 2011, 2012. Uh, and I, I started the shop by bringing back, um, some guitars by Christelle Cayo, which is a great friend of mine, a great guitar maker. Um, she makes these really nice guitars that are kind of a new approach on Selmer style guitars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started with that originally it's just a kind of like representing a maker in the States. And then it kind of grew to setting up a lot of guitars And because I started getting sort of a reputation for being the setup guy for these guitars, uh, then I started thinking, oh, well, maybe I can make like lesser guitars better. Mm. And then that kind of in turn then expanded to developing guitars with with China, um, working with Japan, a lot of other things, still while maintaining these handmade luthier guitars. Um, Awesome. So how, it's, how about the playing side nowadays? Like how much how much of your time is devoted to practice, play, gigging? I, I try to I try to play as much as possible. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the like the business and whatnot uh, it takes me away from the playing as much as I would really like. Mm. Um, but fortunately, when I, because I get do get to travel and I do get to do a lot of like exhibi- trade exhibitions and whatnot. I find time to demonstrate a lot of instruments and and do that. And um, aside from like the Django style, that's where I do most of that. Um, I play a lot of music that's uh, not so much Django, but more related to what was going on in Paris 
with G Hungarian gypsies and Romanian music in this kind of fusion or intersection point with um, classical music, Romanian folkloric type of stuff and sort of mm. fusing everything together. That's kind of what I'm doing these days uh, mm. with a band with my wife. Uh, it's called Trio Diniku and we play a lot of um, this kind of thing. And it, it's for, for me, it's kind of the, like I was saying earlier, it for me, it's my feelings about the, the, uh, the genesis of, of gypsy jazz music mm. pre pre Louis Armstrong pre, you know, the hot five type of time. But in Paris, when you had the, the Vals Musette and all this kind of playing where you'd have these accordionists playing with guitar players and or little mini orchestras, it's this kind of music, but in a modern form. That's amazing because that's chasing something that's never been written down and never been recorded, really. Yes. So it's it's this very tricky era to replicate. There's a lot you gotta do a lot of some investigating to find, you know, some sort of lineage to it. I would assume. Yeah, and that's the challenging thing. I mean, we're we're always traveling and trying to try to go to Hungary and Romania and meet with these people and hear just hear them play, and and that's something that's that's a whole other uh, thing that I discovered along the way that there is these schools of guitar players from Hungary and Romania that are absolutely incredible, mostly undiscovered that mm. play their own kind of jazz. They're gypsies, but it's very, it, it's complicated. It's, it's complicated to explain, but it's really, um, it's in what least, sense is it jazz? Uh, well, most of the guys from Hungary really love George Benson. And <laughs> okay. They, yeah. They really play George Benson, like, to a T. Like, it's huh. absolutely incredible. They play, like, Bossa Nova and stuff. But they play traditional Hungarian music or the Chardash or the the Nota or, you know, Halgato. Uh, they play this kind of traditional old-style song, but on the guitar with blistering speed and incredible musicianship and <laughs> that is so funny it's like <laughs> you wouldn't think that you know it's like all this like stuff in 11 and then like you know give me the night <laughs> <laughs> well that's exactly so, the, so we're that's exactly black. the contrast and uh when i actually discovered this because i became really obsessed with this record called gypsy guitars that was recorded in the early 90s by Angelo DeVar, Serge Camps, and Frank Anastasio. And, um, you know, since listening to that, they did a couple tracks on there that were Hungarian guitar arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, they recorded all the violin parts, you know, what was originally violin music in the wrong key. So it irritates a lot of Hungarians who are purists, but we, I sort of started picking that apart and trying to learn this kind of gypsy guitar style that mm -hmm. played the the Hungarian music in a gypsy jazz format with the bass and two guitars. So knowing the counter melodies, the bass line, walking bass lines in conjunction with the you know with the bass and mm -hmm. the guitar. And when I when I got a chance to sit down with Serge, he started teaching me these these uh, fingerings and the the way that you play this and the right hand technique and playing the off beats. This kind of instead of I'll show you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so instead of you know a gypsy rhythm this kind of thing yeah so alternating kind of, bass line chord bass note chord bass note chord exactly so you, yeah. you're playing you're playing alternating the bass and the bass is moving while mm -hmm. the bottom half is shifting or playing that you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly. it's so funny because it's like, you know, I'm from Israel and mm -hmm. our our traditional is like we don't we're, we're a new country. But in the 40s, everybody my family's from Romania and Lithuania, you know, so yeah. everybody came from those kind of Eastern. Oh, not everybody, but a lot of people came from Eastern European countries. And our early music from the 40s is basically whatever was happening in Europe for folklorically. So. Yes. They, the hora, it, we we know. call it the hora, We call it the mm It's like that's the mm -cha, mm -cha, mm -cha, like that's the beat for everything. You know, bass note chord kind of thing. And yes. It's, and it's so bizarre. Like the the bizarre thing is to think that like you know, 
which which is bread your bread, bread and butter learning this is that Django didn't invent all this stuff he was ta- mixing it he was really like a fusion guy like bringing yeah. jazz into it but doing the real expl- exploration of what was going on in Europe you know before before all that and to me that's that's the mind blowing thing about coming up in the states everything here is so blues infused and mm-hmm. they came up with this whole other like folkloric tradition that has nothing to do with blues. It's a totally different system, but it has this kind of color, you know, to it. There's this mm-hmm. kind of element that that I think dictated what Django was. There's definitely, you don't hear it harmonically, but the way it's being played and the way it's interpreted is so apparent. If you have a background in listening to Romanian music, you know, music from mm-hmm. Moldova, Ukrainian music. There's this folk element to it. It's kind mm-hmm. of folky. Yeah. But, but it's kind of hard to put your finger on what it is. But you know it's yeah. there. And I think that's part of what makes this music attractive to people. Yeah. And addictive. Yeah, yeah. very, very, very yeah. universal. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just being deep and being some somehow connected to something archaic, right? Like some, some sort of first music. Yes, or, yeah, I mean that that's really like the the thing about, you know, people too when they speak to you like if if there's some sort of depth to them, it always seems that it's not really it's not really something that they came up with that you're you're attracted to, it's some sort of connection they have with something. Yeah. And that thing tends to be history or some mm-hmm. sort of accumulative wisdom. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I definitely Okay, so where can we find your stuff online musically? Sure. Well, you can find uh, what I do musically on YouTube. If you search me, there's Mm -hmm. various videos of me in um, various situations playing the guitar. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Um, How about how about you and your wife's music? This this yeah, you can you can you can check us out at uh, Trio Diniku. It's T R I O D I N I C U dot com. Uh, my, you can see me demo most of the guitars at djangoguitars.com. That, that's awesome, dude. That's, it's so incredible what you're doing. And I really I like, if I know the people watching this, they're all, they're already making plans for like, what the fuck is that thing behind his ear? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't take that one. <laughs> well, the, the big, a big part of like what, what I do here is, is the, the business in, in turn fuels the collecting and preservation of a lot of things uh-huh. to so that people can enjoy them open source. That's the that's the other side of things that I have a lot of interactions with guitar makers and whatnot. I do this to fuel the passion. Yeah. So it's you know on the wall you see behind me there's original Selmer molds and parts and you know things that a lot of other people aren't interested in but you know we try to preserve it in such a way and uh, uh, you know we uh, always we always welcome people reaching out and conversations and, you know, sharing of information. And we're totally open to that. So uh, that's awesome. I mean, I feel like I just like went on a play date with a kid who has much superior toys and like go, I'm walking home all jealous now. So like, <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Everybody's for... going to love it. And yeah. Yeah. This, this is, this is going to be great. <laughs> well, it's a great it's a great conversation, you know, and I hope it uh, hope it opens people's minds to more more of what this music has to offer. And I, I really appreciate you uh, thinking of me and and uh, of course, thank, thank I, you. I, for I look forward to, I look forward to talking to you off off yeah. Skype because this is really yeah. the first time we've ever talked. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna make it a habit. You'll be back too. Awesome. <laughs> okay. See, see you, Tommy. Okay. Nice chatting. Cheers. Bye bye.